Thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, and we welcome you to the first in our series of industry focused training campaigns. Um, I know most of you, but for the ones I don't, my name is David Meany. I'm joined today by my marketing team. They will be running some of the web functions and interactive polls that we're gonna do uh, both before and after the training today. The chat box will be open during the training, uh, but we will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So we're very excited to have all of our manufacturers reps and our distribution partners on this training today. That's something new. Um, so we're, we're making it more application and industry focused than, than product focused. And we're really hoping that everybody gets a lot out of that. So today's training, we're gonna be looking at frequency control and power management in the transportation industry. But before we jump into all that, we have a couple of poll questions that we'd like to ask you. Uh, the first one is, we'd just like to get some feedback on approximately how many transportation customers you think you have in your region. Um, you should see that poll up there now. And uh, we'll let everybody take a minute to go in there and, and uh, just give us a rough idea. It's, it's just really to measure how we're doing for ourselves, honestly. Awesome. So it looks like we've got like a good amount of folks in. About 51 percent, so we have about one to five customers in the transportation space. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So um, let's ask one more question here. We just want to know uh, your your level of familiarity with ECS's products for transportation and automotive. If, if you're familiar with the automotive, so you'll see that up there now. So we'll keep the poll up for about 45 seconds so everybody gets a chance to answer. And again, this is really just trying to get a measurement for um, how well um, you have an understanding and if there's areas in your market that you can now see after, after going through this that maybe you could attack with some of these products. Awesome, so it looks like we're coming in with 44% have little knowledge of ECS products for the transportation sector. Okay, well, let's uh, let's aim to improve on that for sure. Um, uh, and with that, thank you. So um, we're gonna jump right in here. So the training outline for today, it's gonna consist of uh, some industry overview for transportation, um, some specific applications, uh, where timing and um, power are uh, commonplace and, and we've seen some uh, some applications, what the role of timing is in those applications. Um, short just description, uh, we get a lot of questions about how these products are manufactured and what those standards are. So we'll look at IATF and the AEC, um, again, just surface. Um, we'll show a couple of popular, popular series um, that we're seeing out there in the marketplace that have gained some traction within the market space there. Um, we've also put together some discovery questions for you that you can uh, take with you uh, and sit with your customer. And that way, if, you, if we ask the right questions, we get the right answers. Um, and last but not least, we, we do have a, a lot of resources um, for the automotive and transportation industry both on our web and there'll be some handouts um, that you'll receive after the training today so quickly you know whether it's coordinating traffic signals managing logistics networks or optimizing vehicle operations the ability to keep people and products moving in a busy world requires complex synchronization and control of various elements Transportation by definition includes micromobility, vehicles, public transit, vessels, aircraft, and any supporting or required infrastructure to help them move and get to where they're going safely. With today's training, we hope to equip you with the knowledge and skills that you need to navigate the landscape for the transportation industry, where quality of timing is not just a matter of efficiency, but a fundamental element of safety, reliability, and innovation. Today's automobile is a true marvel of electrical and mechanical engineering. 
The average sedan today has well over 125 microprocessors in use. Every one of those micros is gonna require frequency and timing components with varying degrees of complexity. These components control everything from your radio to an assortment of sensors that monitor tire pressure and engine performance. And of course, the most important of these is gonna include uh, sensors that monitor for collision avoidance that gives us passenger safety. So really the goal of all of this is, is to get away from fossil fuels and to move to a greener lifestyle, right? I mean, that has made the quest for all electric vehicles into a global initiative. This is also the same driving technology behind autonomous vehicles. Hopefully one day this should all but eliminate traffic congestion and auto related fatalities. Um, currently California and Canada are targeting zero emissions before the end of the 2030s. I think that's pretty aggressive, but I thought I'd throw that out there for you. So let's look at some end use cases that are currently implemented and in, in being improved all along for uh, transportation and automotive. First is your infotainment. I will just give a quick kind of description of what these things cover. This is your radio, any wireless streaming services that you might have. Um, this allows you hands-free control and allows you to enjoy a lot of your basic creature comforts, of course. Battery management, of course, this is gonna monitor and control for best life of battery for EVs. We know that mileage is, is everything in the EV world. That's where the battle lies. Lighting controls, internal, external lighting for ease of entry and use, um, safety and security, and also ambient lighting uh, for just drive. Um, then you have seat controls, and this encompasses a lot. So this is all, when you get in your car with your fob, all of your settings in the car will be based on your presets. So your seats, your mirrors, your radio stations are all going to be controlled um, under that function. TPMS is important. Uh, uh, proper tire pressure keeps your car on the road, keeps you safe. Uh, but even more important are the ADAS or Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. Um, that vehicles have in them today. So this is gonna be your cruise control, your radar, radar LIDAR, uh, anti-lock brakings, and any road condition sensor feedback uh, that your external sensors will give you, and anything else that you'll find to keep people safe, seat belts and, and other things. Uh, wireless charging, pretty straightforward. Wanna make sure your phone is charged for communications and navigation. Um, for modern vehicles, but also, you know, any other conveniences you might have in the car, heated seats and steering wheels, massagers, uh, voice control for hands-free phone calls uh, and navigation and climate control, you know, just to name a few that would fall under this category. So what is the touch of timing in transportation? We touched on some of the end user cases in the previous slides, but here's a look where timing plays a role in those applications. So vehicle timing systems uh, might include engine control units, uh, ECUs as they're known, and this will precisely synchronize fuel injection, ignition timing, and other critical functions so you optimize your engine efficiency and keep emissions down to a minimum. Transmission control, somewhere along the same lines, uh, the TCMs coordinate gear shifts and optimize transmission performance, ensuring smooth acceleration and, of course, fuel economy. Infotainment, timing components support enjoyable user end experience. These are all your wireless connectivities, voice activated uh, options for both audio, video, and the infotainment world. One of the real important ones, though, is vehicle to everything or, or vehicle communications, uh, both internal for inertia navigation and outward sensors but as vehicles become increasingly connected to each other timing devices play a pivotal role in v2x or vehicle to everything communication they synchronize the exchange of information between vehicles so that would be v2v and external infrastructure so any warnings any road hazards anything like that where you can receive messages in of situations that are um, imminent to your destination, and all of these things are going to uh, contribute to enhance road safety and certainly traffic efficiency. ADAS, uh, again, that's your, your uh, assisted driver, a uh, driver assist. 
Um, these are your feedbacks, your radar, radar, camera, anti-lock braking, and a whole lot of other onboard sensors. So these are crucial to things like adaptive control, collision avoidance, and even lane keeping assistance. And last but not least, of course, is micromobility. So these are your electric scooters and e-bikes that we see out there all the time. Priming devices are going to play a critical role in managing battery charging, battery cycles, motor controls, and even some braking in, in the newer ones are functions that are being controlled by timing. So you can see as we put all these things together and we're moving towards an autonomous uh, vehicle that these things all need to work together and their timing has to be critical. So if we look at each of one of these applications, we can break them down. They all fall under five different categories. Um, first one being sensors. These are going to be all the feedback that your car and you get to make good decisions on the road. Today's vehicles, of course, they have hundreds of sensors that are continuously monitoring not only safety and vehicle performance, but also the environmental conditions. The sensors can alert drivers to problems with the vehicle's operational status, they can even take control of steering and braking to avoid these hazards. Anybody with a fairly new car understands anti-lock braking, the lane assist when you're drifting, you get that uh, that feedback, haptic feedback from the steering wheel on the seat uh, to let you know that there may be a situation that comes up. Some of the safety features that, that'll safeguard your driving experience on the road, uh, the more common ones, backup sensors that alert the driver to impending obstacles, other sensors alert to Slick road conditions due to rainfall or ice. They can monitor blind spots. They can even prevent the car from functioning when a mobile phone is in use. I'm sure that's coming. Uh, but it is one of the most common reasons for motor vehicle crashes today. Entertainment, you know, uh, we can now link our smartphones to our vehicle control panels and access playlists and podcasts and, and video screens allow drivers to entertain backseat drivers with DVD, Blu-ray and, and other digital media for them to use. And the connectivity side of thing, automobiles are undoubtedly considered part of the Internet of Things today. You can unlock your cars remotely, contact emergency services, navigate routes via GPS, remote start, and that list continues to grow and grow and grow. And what is the end game? The end game for this is autonomous driving. And, you know, that's one of the most remarkable innovations that is being undertaken today. Autonomous or hands-free driving technology, self-driving, self-parking cars are all currently being tested. They do have some limited deployment, but they're going to soon be parked in all of our driveways. The evolution of electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles is going to grow at breakneck. So the products that we offer into this market, automotive and transportation, are very specific in their application and the people that want them are requiring very specific tests to ensure performance is met. The first one is IATF 16949. Essentially, this is the ISO that our manufacturing plants have put in place to make sure that we meet all the manufacturing guidelines for automotive grade products. So um, typical ISO, it's continuous improvement, defect prevention, um, risk management, and contingency planning for moving them to other areas, and all of those manufacturing things that make these products more, more, both more readily available, but make sure they get more hands-on touching and more monitoring during that process. The other side of this is the qualification process for these. So we build them in our AITF factories, but they are tested to meet the AEC-Q200 standard. And the standard is just a, a round of stringent electrical testing, um, put them through some step, put them through their um, stress tests, uh, put them over temperature, uh, moisture, uh, operational life, reliability. There's a whole handful of tests that we need to put these through in order to make sure that they meet the standard for the ACQ200. So there's a lot that goes into this for us to supply these products out to you and 
they all, um, all of them will be built and passed uh, both IETF and AECQ before they reach our customers. So some of the more popular series that, that we look at um, you know, many of our products that we have in the ECS portfolio are transportation capable or automotive capable. We highlighted a couple here that are actually AECQ 200. They don't all have to be, um, and we'll talk about that in our discovery questions. Um, but all ECS automotive grade parts are easily identifiable by the Q in either the series or the part number. So if you see a Q in an ECS part number, that's clearly going to define that it's IETF and AECQ and, and met all of those requirements. So the first one we'll take a look at here is our ECX33QZ. So this is a small form factor, ruggedized crystal. And, and what that means is we have put mechanicals in place internally to this so that it can manage shock and vibration. So these are for use where of course they would see significant shock and vibration um, and these will give high performance for um, trucks and trailers and in, in places uh, TPMS places where you would expect to see um, significant road rage uh, to components the next one is our ECX 12Q uh, this is the smallest automotive grade surface mount watch crystal that's available of course, its frequency is 32.768 kilohertz, just like all watch crystals. But this one can offer extended temp range of minus 40 to plus 125 degrees C operation. And it'll maintain the tolerance across that entire temperature range. So just for a reference, 125 degrees C uh, is equivalent to 257 degrees Fahrenheit. So this product is more than capable of uh, being used in many of the most stringent automotive or transportation applications. The next one is our ECX1637Q. Uh, this is a small form factor surface mount crystal with a wide frequency range capable of 16 to 60 megahertz. Um, we do have a select version of uh, pre-made frequencies, but if the opportunity is good enough, we can manufacture anything in between those. This frequency range is going to cover most, if not all, of the frequencies that are currently used with automotive designers and manufacturers today. So a lot of opportunities coming up with this. The size of this, the 2 by 1.6 millimeter, is actually ideal for minimizing coefficients of thermal, thermal expansion. So in the course of an average day, your car is going to warm up, cool down, turn on, turn off. You're going to see a lot of different temperature changes. And with temperature change, physical properties change. They contract, expand, and the more they do this, the more they are susceptible to things like cracking or even uh, failing completely. Small form factor packages like the 1637Q help to minimize that and limit, uh, you can't get rid of, you can limit um, coefficient of thermal expansion or CTE. Um, and here we have uh, some other parts. So uh, some oscillators and shielded power inductors that we're seeing lots of activity from the transportation industry. Um, first one we'll look at is our ECS3225 MVQ. Hopefully most, most of you guys are familiar with MV. Um, we do have Q versions of those are automotive. Um, so our MV series is uh, a, gr a set of oscillators that are designed to operate over a wide supply voltage, typically 1.6 to 3.6 volts, but they're completely compatible with static supply voltages, 1.8, 2.5, 2.8, 3, 3.3, 3 .3. whatever your customer is using currently, um, this product can drop in there and work fine. Or if there's a battery or diminishing power situation, these will operate perfectly all the way across that range. They offer great performance with plus or minus 20 ppm over the rated temperature range and sub one picosecond of jitter. So these are ideal for applications that require clean, stable clocking. 
Next is uh, our most popular inductor series. It's our MPI 4040. It's a small form factor shielded power inductor. Um, it offers an inductance up to 10 micro Henry's, very low EMI, in a current rating up to 4.8 amps, which is pretty significant. Most electronics won't come anywhere near that. These products in, in all of our inductors, they're ideal for making sure that sensitive electronics in today's vehicles only get clean, stable power. You have a lot of motors, you have a lot of things within vehicles and many applications for that matter that generate noise and that noise gets put on the power line. And if you can imagine that to your micros and, and to your processing, that could probably uh, be an issue that you would want to eliminate. By using our shielded power inductors, we put those in line before the sensitive electronics, we spare them uh, all of that noise and nastiness. So in supporting the automotive industry, we try and have product in stock that has the required specifications that the design engineers are going to need. So we work closely with those engineers and we develop the needed products to fit the needs of those technologies for tomorrow, today. And we put those products out in the market before some of the tech is even in production. This way, engineers and manufacturers can get them before their designs are even completed. Some of the most popular applications and frequencies might include Wi-Fi, modern cars have Wi-Fi. This gives you access, internet access in your car. Um, Wi-Fi might use a 38.4 or a 40 megahertz crystal. Um, of course, Bluetooth's been around for a long time. 16, 32, or 38.4 megahertz crystal to make sure your phone is connected through your infotainment system. Um, the car's GPS, that's probably going to have a 16.38 uh, or 26 or a 40 megahertz TCXO in there to make sure you can move about your happy way and get to your destination safe. And even simple things like key fobs. Um, so depending on the country, may use a, a 13.5 or a 9.843 megahertz crystal. And this will get you door locks, unlocks, remote starts, trunk accesses, and a myriad of other things that you can get to just by using a key fob. So how do we approach this with our customers? So we've come up with a few discovery questions and, and we'll share these with everybody. Um, at the end of the presentation today, and it'll just help you to understand what they are trying to do. So there are lots of questions you can ask your customers. Typically, they're going to revolve around mechanical and electricals and or if it's part of our inductor series, some of the specs that are attached to the inductors. So and I'm not going to touch on all of them, but, you know, a, a good question is, does your application require all components to be ACQ200? And for a lot of these, there are no. If you're second or third tier to the automotive industry, you may not need to be supporting AECQ 200 components. And this is important. Um, while pricing isn't that much different, uh, it does allow you more flexibility to provide them maybe standard off-the-shelf parts. Second one, does your application require PPAP support? Um, this, this is actually really critical. So PPAP, for those who don't know, it's production part approval process. But what it really is, is a deep dive into all the way back to where the raw materials came for, for the product that you're supplying to that automotive customer. Um, under the electricals, of course, frequency, you know, this is going to be the clock speed that will regulate the performance and cadence of your application. So we definitely need to know that. Um, the operating temperature is going to be also critical because that is going to decide what your tolerance and stabilities are going to be for that. Uh, for those that don't know, um, there's kind of a give and take with uh, tolerance, stability, and temperature. The wider in temperature you go, the um, wider in uh, tolerance and stability or the, the more degraded um, your tolerance and stability will be. So uh, temperature will, will have a critical function for that. Um, and for inductors, again, all the environmental conditions, temperature and everything are still critical here. Um, besides, you know, how many micro you're looking for, one of the critical ones is going to be 
how much current do you expect your system to draw? Um, and you really need to take a close look at that. And when you're sizing the proper inductor for that applications, you want to have it uh, at least one to 1.5 times the calculated number. That way you give your inductor plenty of headroom to operate sufficiently and make sure that it's able to provide clean, stable power to all of those um, sensitive electronics that are downstream from it. So um, we won't go through all of these. We'll, we'll share these with everybody. It gives you uh, a, a way to sit with your customer and make sure that they're getting exactly what they need. Besides the besides those, um, we have a lot of resources available for you on our website. Um, you can go to our automotive industry page. You can find uh, more information about uh, specific products and applications. You'll find article section with insights and, and relevant posts. And we will continue to post more content in there as we move through this quarter. So this is transportation quarter for ECS, and we're going to continue to put information up on our website um, to give you access to that so that you can know what's coming and maybe have more insight for some of those customers. Also, we've uh, put together some really good resources that you can download and use with your customers. Um, after the training today, you're gonna receive a packet that includes um, application overview. You know, This discusses end uses cases for automotives, uh, an AEC Q200 product highlight guide, and this is going to feature our, our most popular automotive grade products, and a link to our interactive automotive catalog. And the catalog is great because the interactivity allows you to click on the families and it'll take you to there. You can read about them, download data sheets, you can check for um, inventories. So it's it's a great way to really show your customer that you have them covered in the automotive space. So we actually have a couple minutes here. Um, I wanna play a video for you. This was released a couple weeks ago now. Um, it's really a highlight for our transportation industry um, campaign that we're running this month. Um, if the video isn't, isn't good for you, if your connection isn't what it could be, it's also on our YouTube page, so you can go over there and see, that, see this and many of our other videos. So let me play this for you real quickly. Hopefully you find it uh, useful. From consumer vehicles to public transit and micromobility, the transportation industry continues to push the bounds of innovation with cutting edge designs that revolutionize the world of mobility. Hello. I'm David Meany, Vice President of Global Technical Sales and Marketing at ECS Inc. International. Over the last decade, the evolution of transportation has taken innovation to new heights. The integration of connectivity, autonomous intelligence, and electrification will continue to accelerate the designs of the future. ECS Inc.'s dedicated technical team collaborate with design engineers to find solutions across a broad spectrum of applications. Spanning from advanced driver assistance systems to wired and wireless charging accessories and everything in between. ECS Inc.'s diverse portfolio of automotive grade frequency control and power solutions include crystals, standard oscillators, voltage flexible multi volt oscillators, and shielded power inductors. Our automotive grade products are IATF 16949 certified, AEC Q200 qualified, and PPAP supportable ensuring reliable performance, even in the harshest environmental conditions. Product options include enhanced efficiency, ruggedized shock resistance, and compact sizing. For your transportation application, ECS Inc.'s team of engineering experts are here to help you find your electronic component solution. Visit our website for more engineering tools and resources. At ECS Inc., we are here to help you build for the future. Yay. So whoop. as we wrap things up here, we're going to take one more quick poll to measure your understanding of frequency control in the transportation industry, and then uh, we'll unmute everybody and have a Q&A.
All right, so Dave, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one question is, are all of these registerable products? Absolutely. Um, so ECS has 100% registerable products um, that, um, that you can use, and they are all open for um, either through distribution or whatever the channel is for design registration, absolutely. Awesome. We have another question. Um, do you have to use Q-rated products for automotive applications, or can you use standard product offerings? It's a great Excellent question. question. Excellent question. Uh, a lot of manufacturers are second and third tier, and they will qualify their products as finished goods. For instance, uh, Delphi doesn't use uh, or require AEC Q200 product they register and qualify their radios as AEC Q200 certified. So, no, not all uh, automotive customers will require AEC Q. Perfect. And we actually have another question. Are there under other industries that could use AEC Q rated products? Yes. <laughs> uh, excellent. Great questions. Um, actually the majority of our business comes from non-direct automotive customers. So we get a lot of inquiries from municipalities that are doing gas and water metering. Um, they wanna make sure that their products have this stringent testing. Um, the medical, uh, so AEDs that you see that are out and about in public areas, uh, a lot of home uh, care happens. They're sending people home with um, with machines, medical machines, and they want to make sure that these are going to run flawless for them. Uh, and even in the industrial automation space, uh, we've seen a lot of applications there where either they need the extended temp range or they just want the, the high reliability that you get from Q-based products. Um, so, Dave, another one. I'm not familiar with PPAP. Can you explain that to me further? So, in, in short, and we talked a little bit about it earlier, the automotive industry puts in place uh, a stringent way to make sure that they can trace products back. So, if there are failures, um, they can literally go back to the raw materials. Uh, for manufacturers, this is a uh, this is a large burden that is, is put on us, but um, it is something that uh, ECS is prepared to do. We do need to know this upfront, again, exactly. Um, so it's it's a, a requirement that is, seems to be fading, uh, but I think if you're gonna work directly with a, a GM or, or a Honda or something, um, you would expect that they're going to want to have this in place. Awesome, and we have one more that's come in. What type of engineering support does ECS offer for the transportation industry? So uh, this is gonna come from a lot of different angles. Um, so we have our distribution partners that are out there. They have FAEs that are capable of going in and working with customers. Um, we have our manufacturers reps uh, who have uh, deep technical knowledge of, of, of what our products are. We have our RSMs. Uh, who are very knowledgeable. They, they are available to travel in to see customers. But even from a direct engineering uh, position, uh, ECS is set up to be a support mechanism. So we have in-house engineering that can, of course, make recommendations for products. Uh, we can review schematics uh, for board layouts. We can even take in boards and power them up and do a full review of the timing functions on the board and give you back um, a report for that data. We do ask that we vet this out. We can't do this for, for just anybody, but, um, and also myself, uh, I'm available to travel. Uh, often come into the territories uh, with the guys and, and we can go visit customers and uh, we can sit down in, in their office and have a direct, direct discussion uh, about what products they could use or should use. Wonderful. I'm not seeing any other questions come in, Dave, so I will okay. hand it off to you for our last poll question. Awesome. Awesome. Um, you can go ahead and put the poll question up.
Wonderful. Well, thanks for your feedback. It's great to see the change. It looks like we're getting over 50% of our audience having moderate or high confidence in product knowledge for ECS products for transportation. I, I mean, that's awesome. Honestly, you know, from our perspective, we just need you to open the door um, and we're the experts. Um, as long as you have, have enough knowledge to know when to drag us into uh, the situation, then you have enough knowledge to go out and be successful selling um, in that market. So with that, um, you know, I want to invite everybody back uh, for our next training session. That'll be on April the 5th, and it'll be focusing on industrial applications. Um, and hopefully we can get as good a turnout as we get for this one. Thank you everybody for coming. Hopefully you uh, gained something from it. Take care and have a great day, everybody.